Hello, and welcome to another edition of ABI Podcast. I'm Professor Drew Dawson of the University of Miami School of Law, and I will be your host today. Our guests are the Honorable Henry Calloway, Chief Judge of the U.S. Bankruptcy Court for the Southern District of Alabama, and Jonathan Petz, Executive Director of Upsolve. Thank you both for joining me today. Thanks for having us, Andrew. Together, you co-authored a piece recently for the ABI Journal called Too Broke for a Fresh Start. It's a great article, and I actually have used it as a reference in teaching my bankruptcy course this semester. Uh, but for those who have not yet had a chance to read it, I was wondering, Judge Calloway, if you could give us a brief overview of the problem you identify in the article. Well, I feel like to some extent we're selling people a, a little bit of a bill of goods when it comes to filing Chapter 7, because we say, hey, we've got this great program. If you get overwhelmed by a debt, you want to make a fresh start, you can file Chapter 7. Um, and oh, by the way, we've made the system so complex that you essentially need to have a lawyer to help you, and that's going to cost you a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars. And you also have to pay another three hundred thirty-five dollar filing fee. So uh, we know you're broke. We know you're filing, want to file Chapter Seven, but we need eighteen hundred dollars up front before we can file for you. So the problem I see is that either people get pushed into Chapter Thirteen, which is a lot more expensive, a lot more problematic, a lot more uh, failure prone, or they don't end up filing at all, and they just end up muddling their way, way through. So what the article explores are some alternative methods that are sort of being discussed and, and, and coming about, one of them being uh, electronic self-representation, the other being the upsob model that uh, Jonathan's involved with. Yeah, it's really, it's, it's fascinating how this has become such a, uh, the sticker shock of Chapter 7, how the price has gone up over time. And I'm really interested in talking to you about the experiments that you discuss here. But before we do that, real quick, Jonathan, could you give us a brief um, explanation and perhaps of, of why Chapter 7 has become uh, so expensive for consumers to get into? Sure. Well, I think it, there's a really clear uh, answer, and it, it traces back to 2005 and the, the amendments to the Bankruptcy Code under BAPSIPA. And those amendments basically increased the amount of work that bankruptcy lawyers have to do on Chapter 7 cases significantly in terms of collecting new documents um, and uh, personally verifying uh, under penalty of perjury the accuracy of, of everything that goes into a bankruptcy petition. So those amendments have, you know, since then, the, the cost of Chapter 7 has significantly increased. And as a result, the uh, amount of filings uh, over the past decade has, has pretty much steadily decreased. And, and we think that's because the, the people who need access to Chapter 7 most are the ones who are least able to afford this price increase. One thing I see in my court is that um, the general practitioners have, have essentially been pushed out of de debtor representation. You know, when I started doing bank bankruptcy work a couple of decades ago, a lot of general practitioners would do your occasional Chapter 7 or even Chapter 13. Uh, case, but it's gotten so complicated that I really only see dedicated uh, debtors counsel who, who don't do anything but that. And also, uh, that means in the rural counties, uh, you know, a lot of the counties that I serve, my third, of my 13 counties in my district, really only two have a significant population, and the rest are pretty rural. In six of the 13 counties, there are no bankruptcy practitioners. In another three or four of them, there's only one bankrupt bankruptcy practitioner. So there aren't really many lawyers doing uh you know, bankruptcy work other than those in, that I see in the metropolitan areas that, that specialize in that work. It's also expensive. You have to pay for the best case or other software, uh, which you're not going to do if you're just doing one or two bankruptcies a month. So what's happening? What are people doing? Do you see, are you seeing either, you know, if you have empirical data on this or just sort of anecdotal, or are you seeing more people filing pro se, or maybe are, are people just not filing for bankruptcy relief, even though, you know, in theory, it should be helpful to them? Well, what I see in my district are uh, people filing 13s when they should be filing 7s. In fact, the, the, the bankruptcy practitioners, to some extent, laugh and call them slow chapter 13s. The, when I look at the data on a countywide basis, the poorest counties in my district have the highest percentage of chapter 13s. Dallas County, Alabama, where Selma is located, has 90% chapter 13s, and whereas Baldwin County, the, most, the richest or the most prosperous county in my district, has the lowest percentage of chapter 13s. Something seems wrong with that. Um, and also, and I see Chapter 13s that are essentially not paying much more than attorney's fees or, or may, maybe paying for a piece of junk car, you know, a three or $4,000 uh, car uh, in a Chapter 13 where they're paying $4,000 in attorney's fees. 
Jonathan, have you seen trends like that in other districts around the country? Sure. I think people that would benefit from seven ending up in a 13 is, is particularly pronounced in the South. Uh, but inability to pay for Chapter 7 is really a nationwide phenomenon. Um, ProPublica, the, the nonprofit uh, journalism organization, uh, has recently done some really uh, interesting studies on on the poor's inability to access Chapter 7. And there's one quote uh, from a debtor in Indiana that really resonated with me. And this debtor said that Chapter 7 is a worthless solution if you can't pay because you don't have money. It's a sad realization that the legal system isn't there for us. And what that, that quote gets to, I think, is that our bankruptcy really risks losing their legitimacy in the eyes of the public when Chapter 7 can only be really accessed by debtors who have money. I think there are several factors, or, or actually maybe many factors, that, that are skewing my court and other, other similar courts towards Chapter 13. You know, my district's 72% Chapter 13. Um, Middle District of Alabama is 77% Chapter, chapter 13. Um, whereas the Northern District of Florida, which is immediately adjacent to us, is only 20%. So I think uh, some of that is, I think a lot of that is related to the uh, more generous exemptions that they have there. And also they have non-judicial foreclosure, which gives you some time, um, you know, for, for a bankruptcy or, or to save up some money for a Chapter 7 bankruptcy. But, and, and also, um, you know, Bob Wallace and, and his group have done some pretty convincing studies showing that African-American debtors get uh, steered into Chapter 13 more for yeah. reasons which are, are difficult to explain. Um, of course, you have att attorney's uh, self-interest but um, I think a lot of it, and I'm hearing anecdotally, anecdotally is a lot of it is that just debtors cannot come up with $1,500 or, or $1,800 up front. Whereas Absolutely. you can file Chapter 13 with, with no money down. And debtors attorneys tell me that you sit across the table from the clients and say, you qualify for Chapter 7, uh, or you, or, but I'm going to need $1,000 up front plus the 335 filing fee, or you can file Chapter 13. I can file it for you tomorrow with no money down. So what are they going to do every time they go over the more expensive chapter 13, even though it costs them here locally $4,000 in attorney's fees versus a thousand um, versus a thousand that they would pay uh, for a chapter seven, although they have to come up with it up front. You know, it's almost yeah. like we're a title pawn company, you know, pay, pay more <laughs> if you don't have, if you don't have money. And, and the sad, the sad result of, of what the judge just described is these chap these no money down chapter 13 cases are dismissed at an extremely high rate. And so really people are going through this process of filing no money down 13 and then their, their case is dismissed and then um, they're worse off as if they'd never filed before. They have no lasting debt relief in, in most cases. Further undermining, as you mentioned, sort of the, the perceived legitimacy of the bankruptcy system. Absolutely. Well, I, I think this is very powerful. If, if your article did nothing else than sort of highlight this as a problem, it would be a really worthwhile read. But, you know, you do more than that, and you go on and you describe a couple of experiments that are uh, being on trial runs in various courts throughout the country to sort of help improve access to the fresh start. And the two you mentioned, as Judge Calloway already sort of alluded to, are the electronic self-representation and online legal aid. And... Um, Judge Calloway, if you don't mind just sort of telling us a little bit about electronic self-representation, um, I don't think this is actually something you're, you're using in your court, so I don't, you know, you don't need to comment on the actual policies in any particular district court, uh, any bankruptcy court, but it'd be helpful for our listeners perhaps just to sort of understand what you mean by this as a possible solution. Well, electronic self-representation or ESR is coming to uh, bankruptcy courts nationwide as a, as a module of the next gen case management software that that all the bankruptcy courts use, and I'm not personally familiar with it because we don't have it. We don't have the, the new next gen in our court yet. Um, I think we're supposed to get it in a few months, but some courts are using it now. But it's essentially uh, it's like a, a turbo tax for for uh, simple bankruptcies where uh, debtors can uh, fill out a questionnaire on the court's website and it, and print out the documents and uh, file pro se using, um, you know, using a program as opposed to using a, either an attorney or, or a bankruptcy petition uh, preparer. So I'm, I'm interested in it because um, in, in part, I, I, I'm, I'm from a very low pro se district. 
um, you know, about 1%. Um, and some of those are Chapter 13s where people are filing just to stop a foreclosure and then they get dismissed after a month or so. Um, but and so I don't have the big pro se problem here that, that a lot of courts have. And I know a lot of bankruptcy judges are very reluctant to do anything that will encourage uh, pro se's. Um, but I'm interested in maybe uh, this ESR being used with attorneys um, that, for example, maybe with a limited scope representation where you could pay an attorney a discounted amount, maybe three or four hundred dollars, let them help you fill out your your bankruptcy forms using the ESR, and then you go through, you file it yourself and, and go through uh, pro se, but at least you've had the assistance of an attorney um, who has helped you out with it. But I think, I keep telling the, the bankruptcy attorneys, this is sort of the wave of the future. I, 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 we cannot continue to expect uh, lawyers to be the toll keepers of the bankruptcy system where you have to stop and pay the toll keeper $1,000 before you can get access to the bankruptcy system. Something's gonna have to break loose. And I think the ESR is, is, is part of that. I want to pick up on one little comment you made there, Judge Callaway, which is about the idea that this could encourage more pro se filers. Is that something that people have voiced as a concern about ESR? Uh, I've, you know, at some of these bankruptcy judge workshops, I've heard people um, voice that concern that we're going to encourage people to file pro se by making it easier. Um, I disagree with that uh, notion. I think that anything you can do to smooth out the process and 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 uh, you know make it easy make it easier for people to navigate the process is good. I mean, if you think about any other federal benefit or, or federal program, uh, you don't have to hire a lawyer to get Social Security benefits. You know, you don't have to hire a lawyer to get uh, Medicare coverage. You know, why do you have to hire a lawyer to file bankruptcy? The, the income tax system is extremely, extremely complex, much more complex than, than the bankruptcy code. But yet we have TurboTax that lets people go down to Office Max and pay $29 and, and fill out their information. Um, you know, in, in a uh, computer program and send it in. I don't understand why we can't do ultimately something similar to that for uh, simple Chapter 7 bankruptcies. Well, thank you. And I want to turn to you, Jonathan, now to ask about the online legal aid experiment. You know, can you tell us a little bit similarly, what does this look like and what do you see as its pros and cons? Sure. Well, as, as you know, there's, for, for many years, there have been brick and mortar legal aid organizations across the country um, some of whom offer free bankruptcy assistance in Chapter 7 matters. But the problem is that they have uh, extremely limited uh, resources and, and really are not able to help uh, a significant volume of, of debtors who need this service. And so my nonprofit, Upsolve, was founded in 2016 out of Harvard Law School's Access to Justice Lab to solve this problem. And Upsolve is an online legal aid organization that provides Chapter 7 assistance for low-income debtors who need a fresh start but can't afford counsel. And the way it works is debtors are screened online or by our network of brick-and-mortar legal aid organizations. And debtors will create an account and they will enter everything they make, spend, owe, and own, uh, go through a, a guided interview, uh, upload pay stubs and tax returns, uh, and then our software will generate a draft of the bankruptcy forms, uploading all creditors, and, and uh, our attorneys will review those forms and make sure that they look good. And at the end of that process, the, the debtor will be able to file them pro se with a, a, a letter from Upsolve saying that, that we've assisted the debtor that aren't their attorney. And, um, and then our process guides the debtors through the rest of the, the process, taking their debtor education course, preparing for their 341 meeting. And it is the, the good thing about Upsolve is that it, it reduces an extremely uh, time intensive pro bono model where traditional full representation for pro bono uh, usually takes 10 hours of an attorney's time and Upsolve reduces the amount of attorney time uh, by a, a multiple of that. So we're able to serve a, a lot more folks. And since we started, um, we basically rolled out uh, nationwide at uh, in, in this summer and or, or last summer rather this uh, june of uh, 2018 and we've helped actually 410 people uh, file across the country with 
uh, a 98% discharge rate, which uh, compares favorably to the, the 96% discharge rate that's, that's typical in, in Chapter 7 cases. Um, to, to answer your question about the, the pros and cons, um, compared to ESR, the, the pro of Upsolve is you're getting uh, an attorney review. Um, the con of Upsolve is that we serve a much narrower range of cases than, ESO, than ESR, who basically anyone can use. Upsolve is only for low-income debtors uh, who don't own real estate. Uh, we can't do joint filings, and we also can't help debtors who need to discharge student loan debts. Or, or have other some sort of complication that requires full representation. So would we would it be wrong to see these as competing ESR and sort of the online legal aid or the, in competition with one another, providing access to justice? Are they more complementary? Yeah, I think in the nonprofit world, the more competition, the better, right? We're, we're trying to help uh, low-income folks get a fresh start. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, more people are doing that, the better. Um, as I said, I, I don't think... I think Upsolve is a much more limited tool than ESR because it, it can really help uh, a much smaller category of, of debtors. For example, I'm interested in possibly something like Upsolve being used, you know, being further developed for use by attorneys, you know, so, um, so that so that it's not just limited to the pro bono model. So absolutely. Yeah, um, that would be a way, a way to scale it up. So I I'm, I'm, I'm agree with Jonathan. They're complementary uh, approaches, not not competing approaches. I'm wondering about, you know, Judge Calloway, you, you said you made a comment before about the different Chapter 13 rates up in Alabama than the Northern District of Florida. And, you know, there's multiple causes of that. But one thing that's clear is that local legal culture obviously affects a lot of the filing rates and, how, you know, access to a fresh start throughout the country. And... So I'm wondering about solutions to this access to justice, access to a fresh start problem. Do we, is it, do they need to be fine tuned? Do you think each so solutions fine tuned by district or do you think more global sort of solutions are possible? Well, some of the problem, as I was saying, it involves state law. You know, it, for example, I mentioned Florida versus Alabama and I'm not an expert on Florida law because I'm, I'm in Alabama, but uh, my understanding is Florida has an unlimited home, uh, wage earner uh, ex exemption. See, I mean, I guess it's a head of household wage earner uh, garnishment exemption. So right. you can't garnish the head of household. So they got they have a judgment against them. They have time to save up money for a Chapter Seven bankruptcy if that's what's appropriate. Or they have judicial foreclosure, which takes a year. So they have time again to save up, try to do some kind of mortgage modification. Whereas in Alabama, we don't have those exemptions. You know, you start getting garnished and, you, and uh, you're a low income person, you get garnished, you're barely making it before. You definitely can't survive now. And uh, we have uh, non judicial foreclosure, it only takes three weeks. And so you miss a couple of payments, all of a sudden you're looking at foreclosure in a month. You don't, you don't have the opportunity to save up uh, for a bankruptcy. Um, there may be some, some local culture, culture aspect to it. You know, I, I definitely think, think that's true. You know, we can't solve every problem. And, um, you know, I wish I would like to uh, I think I feel like the, the playing field is tilted toward Chapter 13 unfairly or uh, because of the fact that you can pay your Chapter 13 attorney's fees through the plan, whereas you have to pay your Chapter 7 attorney's fees up front, or at least most attorneys are going to water up front. Some some courts have held that the attorney's fees aren't dischargeable. We have experimented here with allowing attorneys to do, um, you know, split contract deal where they take a little bit of money up front and then the rest of it enter to a separate contract after the petition, which is not dischargeable. Uh, you know, I, I haven't been able to get much traction with that locally. And the attorneys tell me they don't want to be collecting on their Chapter 7 debtors after the petition. You know, they, that's not their business. It's bad for their business model. They depend a lot upon referrals. And uh, they don't want to be trying to collect a few hundred dollars from their, their already, uh, you know, broke clients after they file um, bankruptcy. So, you know, my, my desire would be something that may, a little bit more like Chapter 13, where you could pay your Chapter 7 fees, you know, maybe in six months or something. And, and like Chapter 13, you don't get your discharge until you've, have to, you've paid that money. So the attorneys yeah. would, be, would feel comfortable in, in knowing that they're going to get paid in a, in a 7. Well, that's, that's a really interesting idea and actually leads into something I wanted to ask you both, because as you uh, no doubt know, right, the, the ABI uh, Consumer Commission 
has been working for the past two years to propose changes to the consumer bankruptcy system, and they're set to release their final report on April 11 in the, uh, at the uh, annual spring meeting, the ABI's annual spring meeting. And while you know, I don't think any of us know what's in that report, I thought maybe just the, it'd be fun to ask you, too, uh, what amendments you would like to see or you think would be most effective into our consumer bankruptcy system that could sort of level this field that has been pushing probably too many people into Chapter 13? I mean, as I mentioned before, I would love it if, if there were some ways that, that debtors could pay Chapter 7 uh, attorney's fees through the court, uh, similar to the way that we do with Chapter 13 plans, maybe in some abbreviated fashion, you know, four months or five months or six months, so that they could get file, get some relief from the garnishment or whatever is driving them into bankruptcy and then be able to, you know, post petition with their with their non garnished wages, be able to pay their attorney uh, over a period of a few months and, and then get then get their discharge. It usually, you know, it usually takes several months anyway uh, to work through a chapter seven. So I wouldn't really envision it. it would take longer to you know really extend the term of a chapter seven or turn it into a mini chapter thirteen. Other than that, I, I don't know. I, I wish I have found since being a judge, I've only been a judge four years, that I, I never get redemptions of, of automobiles. I'm, I, bet, I bet I've had maybe eight redemptions in four years because nobody can come up with the money to redeem their their vehicles. Um, yeah. Even if they're way upside down in a Chapter 7, um, there are some like online uh, – redemption finance companies, but they charge like 25 or 27%. So unless it's just a huge differential between the value and the amount owed, it's, it's not going to make sense uh, to do that. I wish there was some, I've been thinking about this, and I wish there was some way to develop a um, a better redemption system or some kind of mechanism, some kind of court mechanism, so that people can keep their cars without having to uh, file Chapter 13, that they could do it in, in a Chapter 7 instead. I've tried to you know, encourage local lenders to do to develop some kind of uh, redemption market, you know, some, some redemption financing market. But uh, you know, so far, I haven't been able to get any interest in it. That that's interesting, Drew. A, a couple other ideas that that occur to me are uh, Chapter Seven is really even for debtors who do have money and do have a lawyer. It is really hard for debtors who live in rural areas. So. You know, the, the state of Montana, for example, um, uh, Montana Legal Services, the uh, legal aid organization there has certain debtors who need to travel 12 hours by car to get to one of those offices. Um, and our bankruptcy rules currently require a wet signature for, for each filing. So, so the client uh, typically will have to, to make that 12 hour drive to to uh, sign the, the forms before they're filed. Uh, also, in terms of 341 meetings, uh, it, mm -hmm. there's no reason why 341 meetings can't be done by uh, video conference. Now, the, the software for doing that, like Zoom or, or GoToMeeting, has improved dramatically over the last few years. These things can be recorded. Debtors can be sworn in. Um, so that's another example where debtors are having to take a day off of work, uh, drive long distances, and what that does is it just it adds to the difficulty and the hardship of, of going through the bankruptcy process unnecessarily. It also goes to the availability of the attorney of an attorney because then it's something we're talking about here locally because some of the areas in my my uh, district are two and a half hours away from one of the two courthouses that we use. And uh, it's not just the debtors; it's also the attorneys because it, you can't afford to take uh, one or two bankruptcy cases if you live two and a half hours away from the bankruptcy court and you're gonna to have to drive five hours total for a, a, a 341 or every time your client wants to do a reaffirmation agreement or something like that, you know, you, you can't do it. There's no way. There's no other kind of uh, small dollar or small attorney's fee proceeding where you have to drive, you know, several hours to the federal courthouse to, to <coughs> handle your matter. If you, if you file a small claim suit or an eviction suit or something, you go to your local county seat, you know, that's five or 10 miles away. You don't have to drive two and a half hours away. So we're looking, we're looking at doing, as Jonathan mentioned, uh, um, you know, 341s by video so that the attorneys can, can sit in their office or have their client come into the office and, um, you know, put it on their, their iPad and, and, uh, do their 341 as opposed to, uh, coming down to the courthouse. 
That's that's super interesting, and I'm really quite excited to hear that. You know, the changes being made. I mean, and you raised so many important and interesting points about our bankruptcy system, which we describe as you know the constitutional mandate of the uniform laws on the subject of bankruptcies. But as you've both been going through this, you see, you know, local state laws and this demographics, geography, all really impact people's access to uh, to bankruptcy's promised fresh start. Well, that's about the end of our time here. Thank you again for, for joining me, and thank you to our listeners for tuning in. Please remember that you can access ABI's archive of over 200 podcast episodes in the ABI online newsroom. Until next time, this is Drew Dawson, and thank you for listening to this edition of ABI Podcasts.